So some of you, I'm assuming some of you remember, in 2003 there was a blackout on the East Coast. Anyone living in the area at that time? You were living there? You remember? Perfect, wonderful. We were living in New York, so we were in the zone. It was quite large. I think it went from Ohio, I believe, up into Canada, down, you know, New England, covered that whole area. Um, it, was, it was kind of fun. That might sound weird, and, and I only say that because there were, there were no major disasters, there were no major tragedies. Um, and so, I, I guess the way I'm wired, I, I like, I like uh, a change of pace, I like something kind of out of the blue, as long as it's not, again, tragic or whatever. Um, it was kind of mysterious, you know, the lights flicker a little bit, they go out, and you're just waiting, they're going to come right back on, right? You always expect they'll come right back on, but they didn't, and so it's intriguing, you don't know what's going on. Uh, what was really, one of the really cool parts was that our landlord, we lived in the second floor, they lived um, on the first floor, and this guy, this is one of those guys that was totally freaked out about Y2K, so if you remember that. So he thought, you know, the computers wouldn't know what to do with, with the, all these, uh, whatever, with, with the change of the date, so he had stockpiled a bunch of food, among other things, so he had one of those big deep freeze chest freezers full of meat. And so he threw a cookout for the neighborhood. So that was probably my favorite part. Well, actually, no. That was my second favorite part of the blackout. My favorite part of the blackout was that you could see stars in New York City. Just beautiful. And we've all seen it, right? I mean, it, we, first of all, we can all appreciate it. As Angelinos, we can appreciate you don't see stars in the city. Uh, but then you get out of town, you, 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 go, you go on vacation, you whatever, you get, out, you get away from the city, and yeah, when you look up, it's just absolutely gorgeous to see this, to see the expanse, right, that, that God created the, the, the stars, and it's just, it's just absolutely amazing, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, there too, it's kind of mysterious, and, and it's, it's kind of intimidating, and, and it's intriguing, and, you know, it, it makes me think of that, that verse from, from Psalm 19, where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. You look up at the heavens, and it's just, yeah, it's screaming all-powerful creator, right? And so, so it's, it's no surprise that as human beings, we just, we can't get our eyes off the skies, especially when there's something to look at. Um, now, we're not the first people to look into the heavens, and of course, we won't be the last people, and we're certainly not the most famous people. I would say that title belongs to the wise men. You know, when, when the story of Christmas is told, uh, you have, um, obviously, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. They're, they are this Christmas story. Jesus is the Christmas story. But whenever the story of Christmas is told, you always hear about the angels as well. You hear about the shepherds, and you hear about the wise men. And the wise men, they, 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 they come onto the scene and, and they're off scene so, so quickly that there's really, it leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions. Even though we as a society, we've, we've made a, a number of assumptions, but really there's a lot of unanswered questions. Like for example, where are, or who were they? And I'll even use our major scene up here um, to illustrate all three points First of all, we, we think of these wise men as kings, right? There's a song, a, a, a well-known Christmas carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are. I don't know where that came from. I really don't care. It's not that big of a deal. But even the way they're decorated, the way they're designed, the way they're decorated, it's, um, as they're, they're portrayed as kings. But they, I don't think they were kings. I'm quite certain they weren't kings. They were, they were um, most likely a class of, of priests, of astrologers or astronomers. They were uh, most likely advisors to the king. Uh, some scholars believe that it's quite likely that they were class descendants of Daniel from the Old Testament. So, you know, Daniel was, um, he, he reached a very high level of government, actually basically second in command. But he, uh, many scholars believe that he was, like, it, it's the same class. Like, the, like, these guys are class descendants of Daniel um, in Babylon. Secondly, how many were there? Well, obviously, there were three, right? Because there was three gifts. There must have been three dudes that showed up, each carrying one gift. There again, that's not likely. They would have traveled in caravans. We don't know is the real answer, but there were probably more than three. And lastly, the, the um, I forgot, oh, when, when. Now, obviously, you know, in a major scene, we always have 
we, we, we have Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. We've got a shepherd in there and, of course, the wise men, right? As if the shepherd showed up and then the wise men showed up later that evening. There's no way they got to the manger. I mean, they had, they had, they had a distance to travel. So my point really is there, there's plenty we don't know. There, there's plenty of unanswered questions. There's things we do not know about these wise men that aren't really that important. The Lord did choose to reveal to us why they came. And that's really the most important detail, right? It says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Whoever they were, wherever they were from, it's, it's, it's not likely and it's not logical first of all that they would even that they would have even known the true god because they were coming from the east they were coming from a predominantly unbelieving nation right that where where the where, where the predominant religion was not um the religion of the true god the god of the bible no matter who they were no matter where they were from it's not likely or logical that they were even searching for this promised Messiah outside of this event. Because again, outside of Israel, the, the, those messianic promises and prophecies weren't nearly as prevalent. Whoever they were, wherever they were from, it's not likely that they would look to Jesus as their savior and that, that they would embrace him as their king. I mean, it's not likely for any of us as sinners. And yet that is exactly their story. By the grace of God, these, these wise men, these magi, not knowing where to find Jesus, not knowing his name, not knowing really how far, how long this journey would be, they traveled hundreds of miles, maybe thousands, into a foreign country, potentially meeting some hostile people along the way. And here's the thing, what did they find when they got there? They found nothing. I mean, they, they, they didn't find any evidence of, of, uh, of a celebration because God's promised Messiah had come to the world. They didn't find any evidence of preparations for a celebration or evidence of, of one that already had, had already happened. What they found was people who were either indifferent or who were afraid or felt threatened. We hear about that in the next verses um, continuing with verse 3, Matthew 2, verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the, peop all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And if you read on after this account, you know that that's a complete lie, right? But, but here's the thing. These magi came to Jerusalem, the capital city, the hub of, of Israel, and, and not only the, the, the national hub, uh, the cultural hub, the religious hub, and news of, and, and so they were the people of, of the long-awaited, much-anticipated promise of a Messiah. And when news arrives here in Jerusalem that that promise had been fulfilled, a, a promise that they had been waiting for for thousands of years, a, a, a promise that was so embedded and ingrained and intertwined with their culture and their way of life. What that, it, it brought about, it, it didn't bring about a sense of peace, it brought about paranoia. The, 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 the news of, of the Messiah, finally the Messiah coming to this earth, it didn't bring about comfort and joy, it, it brought about anxiety. And it's sadly and tragically ironic, right? It, it, it didn't bring about, um, you know, any just, it, it, it was more, I mean, 
Herod, we're told, he felt threatened, right? It didn't bring about a, a sense of, of gratitude or thankfulness. It really, it really fueled selfishness, if you think about it. I mean, King Herod, we're told he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. He was disturbed because he perceived this new king to be a threat. And, and it says Jerusalem was disturbed with him because the reality is that when King Herod felt threatened, literally people died. It's, it's documented, well documented in history that while King Herod was, he did a lot of good things for Israel in terms of development and advancement as a nation. And yet at the same time, he was horribly possessive and paranoid about his position as king to the point where he had numerous people killed throughout his reign and including not just like perceived enemies, not, not like foreigners that, that, you know, that weren't even Israelites, uh, not, not people that he didn't like in the first, I mean, we're, we're talking siblings, we're talking uh, one of his own wives, we're talking one, at least one or more of his own children. He had them put, that, that's how paranoid he was, right? He had them put to death. And so the point is that when, when King Herod felt threatened, when he was disturbed, people died. And so again, it's just, tra- it's, it's sadly, and it's, it's tragically ironic. I mean, the greatest the greatest gift given, ever given, was given to, it was, you know, to, to Herod, to Jerusalem, to Israel, to the world. And instead of peace and celebration and comfort and joy, Herod and Jerusalem were either disturbed or completely disinterested. And, you know, there, there, there's a warning in here for us. And the warning would be that just because a person is religious doesn't necessarily mean that that's not an automatic indicator that that there's a healthy relationship with their savior i mean king herod knew enough to ask the question the people's chief priest as we're told the chief priest and and the teachers of the law they had all the answers they were scholars they were expert in in the old testament scriptures they had all the facts they had they had intellectual knowledge we call that sometimes head knowledge versus heart knowledge, which is conviction or trust in the heart. They had, they had all the head knowledge, right? The, um, the, the, the residents of, of Jerusalem and really of Israel, they had all the, 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 the promises and the prophecies of the past. Religion was just so deeply embedded and ingrained in their culture. And the reality was that Israel, in general, they weren't... They weren't they weren't looking for their king. They weren't seeking their king. They, they were completely indifferent. And so again, the lesson would be that to be religious doesn't automatically mean that you have a healthy relationship with, with your Lord. On the other hand, we hear about the wise men, right? After the wise men had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So for the wise men, as they were seeking their king, in, in, in their search for this king, no effort was too much. I mean, they didn't just hop on a flight and get there in a matter of a couple of hours. No trip was, was, was too inconvenient. No other priority was more important than going and finding and worshiping their Savior. They were Christians. The label wasn't used yet at that time, but they were Christians. And guess what? They didn't care what other people thought of them as Christians. They brought these generous gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and guess what? They, they weren't concerned about how that impacted their, their personal finances. They, 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 there was nothing more important than seeking and finding and worshiping Jesus, their king. You know, there's a, it certainly was an invaluable blessing for the wise men, obviously, and, and it still is for us today. As we consider all the characters here, and especially up against one another and making these comparisons, um, it, it's just a great reminder for us to check where our hearts are at in terms of our relationship with our Savior. 
Jesus didn't come to be a threat. Right? Herod, Herod perceived him as a threat. And I don't expect that anyone in this room would has kind of the same spirit as, as King Herod did. But at the same time, don't we as Christians sometimes see our relationship with our Savior? Isn't it sometimes the, the, the sense that it's, it, it, it's a threat whether to, um, to our relationships? You know, those where other people don't uh, approve or, or think much of, of, of Christians and, and Christian values. Sometimes we, we even subconsciously perceive Jesus to be a threat in terms of um, just our schedules, right? That, that he, he want, just, like, just like the wise men prioritized their meeting and worshiping Jesus, the Lord wants us to prioritize to come and worship and, and to serve him in many, many ways. And, but we're so busy, right? And so sometimes we perceive he's a threat to our, our busy schedules. Sometimes we perceive him to be a threat to our, our finances as the Lord wants us to generously give back to him. Jesus didn't come to be a threat. He, he didn't come to, to, to merely be the, the, the subject of our intellectual exercises. Again, the religious, the, 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 the brains there, they had all the facts, but they didn't have that conviction, that heart knowledge. And so Jesus didn't come just to be the subject of our intellectual exercises, whether that's matching prophecy with fulfillment or even just memorizing historical facts so, so we can tell the story and, and we know the story of Christmas. Jesus didn't come so that we could merely go through the motions of being religious. He came so that we could have a relationship with him. And that's exactly what he did, right? He, he reestablished peace between sinful human beings and our holy God. He, he liberated our hearts and, and our minds from, from sin and guilt. He, um, he, he came to give us a relation. He came to be a light, uh, a, a light in, 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 a, in a spiritually dark world. He came uh, to serve by giving his life as a ransom for all people, including each and every one of you, to pay for your sins. He came to give the assurance of eternal life through faith in him. And so as we reflect on how the, the, the wise men, they went seeking Jesus, they, they sought him out, the Lord wants us to do that too, to seek him out. Jesus, Jesus uses that same word, right? Um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, in response to what God has revealed to us, in response to what he has done for us, in response to what he promises and gives to us, the Lord wants us to, well, among other things, strive for God-pleasing things, God-pleasing thoughts, right? Philippians 4 verse 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness is, among other things, to, to strive to let the truth prevail in our lives, both inside and out. As Paul writes to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. To seek first his kingdom among, again, among other things, is to strive to do his will. Joseph was presented with a very tempting situation in the Old Testament when he was in Egypt in the house of Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife um, tried to seduce him, and, and what did he say? He said, how, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness is to prioritize him, right? As it says in um, Hebrews chapter 10, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, among other things, is to let others see him through you. As Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, love what he loves and, and want what he wants and pursue what he pursues, right? Because, because this king, Jesus, came seeking you. He chose you and he has called you to faith. He has sought you out and he has saved you. He has reclaimed you from sin and he has transformed you to be his follower and to be your king 
not just here on this earth, but for eternal life in heaven. And we pray. We, uh, added to our prayers this morning is a prayer for the family of Ani Nasso, and that's the aunt of Sonique. Uh, she, she went to heaven this last, this last week, a few days ago. So we, we remember her family in our prayers here today. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to be our savior, for, for the glory of heaven that he left in, in coming to this earth. And, and we thank you for all the revelations uh, that, that you have made here on this earth so that people would know exactly who you are and, and what you came to do and, and how you love all people and you want everyone to know and embrace you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for the example of the wise men who are willing to drop everything and to make a long journey uh, to go into potentially um, hostile areas, especially um, the, the king's palace, who wasn't, a, wasn't excited about the birth of Jesus. And they, but they dropped everything because they just had to go and worship their Savior and, and honor him and, and give him generous gifts. Help us to follow that very example, an example of, of, of worship, an example of priorities, an example of... of being proud of, of who we are as followers of our Savior Jesus. Thank you for, for making us your followers, for bringing us into your family. Um, and, and through that, you've given us just a profound peace that can't be found anywhere else. And you give us the, the, the confidence, the guarantee of eternal life with you in heaven. And, and you give us the joy of knowing that uh, we belong to you and that one day, while life on this earth sometimes is incredibly difficult, we know that one day we get to spend eternal life with you in heaven. So help us to follow that example of the wise men as they made you front and center of their lives and sought you out to worship you and honor you with their lives. Lord, we also pray here this morning for the family members and friends of Annie Nasso, uh, the aunt of Sonique, a member here at Hope. Um, she recently passed away. Thank you for her, her kind-heartedness. Thank you for the love and care that she showed. And thank you for making her a blessing to so, so many people. Thank you especially for bringing her into your family of faith, that, that you instilled in her heart a love for you and a trust in you as her Lord and Savior. Thank you for, for holding on to her and, and now ultimately for calling her home to heaven. Uh, death is never, uh, never a pleasant thing. And it's, 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 it's just unpalatable for us as human beings. And at the same time, Lord, you also give us this peace to know that we belong to you. And, and you give us the confidence that our loved ones who die with faith in you are now with you for eternal life in heaven. So thank you for giving that peace and confidence to Annie's family. And continue to remind them of your amazing grace and love and that and that their loved one is now with you for eternal life in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.